Uh, it's great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me today. And um, it's great to see you ordered up some good Florida weather for us. Um, if you uh, want to thank Commander Barrow, if, if you like my presentation, you can thank him. If you don't like it, you can criticize him. Because uh, but for him, uh, my husband and I wouldn't have come up here on our um, honeymoon five years ago and started participating every year. And um, Commander Gaston wouldn't probably not have asked me to, to be with you today. So it's all about Commander Barrow. So um, I hate to read um, speeches, but I have a lot of facts and figures, dates, and quotes. And I don't want to veer off any point. I want to get them right spot on. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to refer to my notes as we go through. Um, and the topic is Floridians in the trial of Major Henry Wirtz. And when Commander Gasson asked me to speak, um, you know, I probably, like some of you who have children in the schools or even went to public schools, know the usual story. You know, the South was awful, slavery, slavery, slavery. You know, Wirtz was a bad guy, Anderson Bill was awful. But the more I've learned, and I think... Uh, Commander Barrow's daughter had really nailed it when she came up here a few years ago and said, we show up every year, we talk about how bad they were to um, major words, and we go home. And that's pretty much what we do, and I'm going to do just that same thing today. So let's get going. Um, Floridians in the trial of Major Henry Wirtz, the Confederate POW camp at Andersonville was infamous. Major Wirtz, generally known as its commandant, paid the ultimate price for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Wurz's trial was the show trial of the century. There was a lot of mitigating evidence ignored in the pursuit of vengeance against Major Wurz. But before getting to the meat of the talk about Floridians, I think it's helpful to review some of these factual oversights. For example, of two and three quarter million total combatants, Two and three quarter million total combatants in the war between the states. There was about 400,000 prisoner of war. 15% of military personnel, three out of 20, would become a POW. That's on both sides. 14% of all POWs would die in captivity. 56,000 were in about two of 20 combatants. Some might not know this, but I think we can relate. A deadly worldwide pandemic was going on during the war. A smallpox epidemic raged through the camps, both northern and southern, and through the civilian populations as well. President Lincoln halted the customary prisoner of war exchanges in late 1863, and that caused a immense buildup in the number of POWs and surged POW camp populations on both sides causing the need for more prison capacity. The Andersonville crisis was caused in part due to its geographical location as Sherman was marching through Georgia and uh, the Union forces were surging into Florida. Uh, many combatants were captured, needed somewhere to go, were not being exchanged. And then a point that I discussed with, um, what's his name from South Carolina? Kevin Brainstein. Here. Glenn LaForce, he confirmed. The prisoner of war camps had a, a problem with overlapping authorities, different silos of responsibility. The so worst was not responsible for the whole kit and caboodle. A lot of people forget that. Key important point. We'll talk about that more. Also, a completely ignored fact was that Southerners were more than twice as likely to die in a POW camp than were federals. One and a half percent versus three and a half percent. Federal to Confederate POW deaths versus total combatant headcount. If you're a Southern man in a POW camp, you had double the chance of dying. I suspect this is a true reason Lincoln stopped the prisoner of war exchanges. It was more fatal to Southern men than to Northern. Why the answer was sim simple. Um, there was a high prisoner of war death rate on both sides. Overcapacity and space per inmate during a pandemic. Let me repeat that. Overcapacity 
and space per inmate during a pandemic. Andersonville, at its peak, held 33,000 inmates. It was designed for 8,000. 8,000, 33,000, big difference. And it was later expanded to about 10,000. Its overcapacity rate versus occupancy that was designed for was almost twice that of its northern counterpoint counterpart, Camp Douglas. Both Andersonville and Camp Douglas would see about 40,000 prisoners during their lifespan, but Andersonville's duration was only about 15 months versus four years of Camp Douglas. So they both had about the same number of casualties, but the impact was greater because the time was shorter. In business terms, demand for prison services at Andersonville surged 420% in just one quarter, a growth rate few organizations could digest. Now let's talk about the pandemic. Inmates at Camp Douglas in the north enjoyed 145 square foot per inmate. In comparison, Andersonville, 18 square feet per person. Its land area is only 25% that of Camp Douglas. Now to put that in perspective, we've all been hearing about how many feet social distancing. Six feet. Give them start of the man in the front row. If you do the math on that, that's 113 square feet per person. Standing here, I need 113 square feet. That's nearly 10 times that what the men at Andersonville had. And this is smallpox and not corona deaden. So in looking at these facts, you may be feeling that works was a victim of circumstances. If you do, a lot of people like me would agree with you. But I believe Andersonville became so high profile because it all happened so fast, so bad, so fast, shock and awe. It had more occupants and more deaths in a shorter period of time than any of the other camps. Camp Douglas, Anderson's northern rival's mortality was stretched over the whole war, while Anderson's will was compressed into just over a year. Practically, Anderson's infrastructure was stressed, could not keep up. The surge was insurmountable. This sudden and dramatic crisis was grist for the northern mills. Evie Pickens with the press and public leaders to exploit into a propaganda campaign that became a gift that keeps on giving to this day. Oh yes, the Lincoln cultures and anti-Southern bigots still use those graphic images of starving inmates at Andersonville in their modern day propaganda war against us, despite the South's desperate attempt to send these men so graphically portrayed home. But no, they would not be exchanged. The New York Times, no surprise, took information out of context. Anybody heard of the fake news? It's not so new. <laughs> to fan the flames of anger against Wurz and Andersonville that could not be extinguished and would demand vindication. The victors would then create the show trial of the century that resulted in the creation of our martyr, Major Henry Wurz. But that also created a strain on the American justice system that goes uncorrected to this get to this day. Now let's get to the meat of the Florida matter. Now that we've covered some basic key facts, students of the worst trial may remember two names, and it is a 800-page document. So I don't expect everybody to have bring their Cliff Notes version today. But let me let me touch these two men, Colonel Gibbs and Dr. Pillow. Colonel Gibbs and Dr. Pillow. These two loyal Southern men from Florida were weaponized against Henry Wurz in the North's blood lust for vengeance. Colonel George Cooper Gibbs was the third witness on the opening day of the Wurz trial. Gibbs was born in 1822 into a multi-racial family with cosmopolitan connections. His aunt, his mother's brother's wife, was an emancipated slave an African princess, Anna Kingsley. Anna survived Gibbs' uncle Zephaniah to run Kingsley Plantation, some of you may have heard of that, on Fernandina Beach, Florida. 
His uncle through marriage was the famous artist John Whistler. Gibbs enlisted at a young age in the Indian Wars. He then moved to New Orleans and worked as a mercantile clerk. He married two days after his 25th birthday, and two weeks later he enlisted in the U.S. Army in the service of the Mexican War. He served as second lieutenant in the 4th Louisiana Volunteers Company H. While away, his wife would give birth to the couple's only child just before she passed. After the war, Gibbs returned to Florida to become a planter. He remarried, and the couple took up residence in nearby St. Augustine. His new wife would have quite a pedigree in St. Augustine, but that's another speech. Upon the outbreak of hostilities against the South, Gibbs would enlist in Florida service. Initially, he commanded the volunteers who seized Fort Marion. Who's been to St. Augustine? Okay, It's that big fort there, Castile de San Marco. That was called Fort Marion. So uh, they tried to do a Fort Sumter there, and he was the one who, who captured it. Prone to sickness, he was soon assigned to various uh, POW camp commands in Virginia and North Carolina, advancing to the rank of colonel. His wife and children were refugees from the Union control St. Augustine, and they would follow Gibbs around on his assignments in train boxcars. In October of 1864, he assumed his final post, relieving General John H. Winder from his command as the Provost Marshal at Andersonville. Winder would not survive the war and would pass away a few months after Gibbs relieved him. Gibbs' first impression of Andersonville related to the striking overcapacity. He likened it to an ant hill. Gibbs, like Wurz, pleaded repeatedly for shelter for camp inmates, but was no more successful. Gibbs left camp on May 4, 1865 to go back to Florida after General Johnson surrendered at Durham Station. He also was paroled. He died in 1873, suffering from the effects of war and reconstruction. But the prosecution used Gibbs, one whom federal POWs viewed as cultivated, urbane, and a humane gentleman, as a weapon against wars at trial. His testimony interrogation take only seven pages of that 811 pages, but prosecuting attorney Baker and judge advocate Holt tried to get Wurz to, uh, Gibbs to blame Wurz for all the grievances at Andersonville. The dogs, the medical care, the prison rules, the deadline, the food, the cornbread, even the, quote, torture, unquote. We all miss sometimes that Wurz's sole responsibility was inside the stockade, not the whole camp, just inside the stockade. But it didn't work, and eventually they frustrated and abandoned the interrogation. But Gibbs cross-examination exposed this complicated chain of command that exacerbated the camp's problem. Indeed, Gibbs made it clear that Wurz had no authority outside of the stockade walls, and that other departments like Commissary, Quartermaster, Medical Corps, State of Georgia, the CSA National Troops, the Army of Tennessee, had roles to play in the care and feeding, clothing, provisioning, and control of the prisoners. He also made an important distinction between the hospital inside the stockade and the second one outside of it. On his way back home to Florida after the trial, Gibbs ran into a mother man that had also been at Andersonville on the riverfront in Jacksonville. Dr. John Pillow. Gibbs told Pillow, quote, I saw Captain Wirtz, but you would hardly have known him. He was so haggard and wild-eyed. He said, in fact, that he did not realize his own identity, but urged me to deliver a message to you. He said, tell Dr. Pillow if the time ever comes when he can fairly do so, I want him to say a word in my vindication. And Pillow would do just that in a manuscript that's on file at the University of Florida. Pillow asked Gibbs why he had not been called to testify, but he already knew the answer. The case had been prejudged. Words must hang. No evidence, no matter how false, was given entire credence. And no evidence for words was uh, an evidence in favor of words was discredited or ignored. 
Well, Dr. John Cruz Palo was a native of Florida, born in Nassau County in 1831. His father was an Indian war fighter and Florida state senator for um, the territorial state. Dr. Palo would represent Alachua County as a delegate to Florida's Secession Convention. He studied at the James Medical College in Philadelphia. In 1863, he enlisted for the service of Florida and as a private and surgeon um, in the Company K, 2nd Florida Cavalry based in Northeast Florida. In January of 64, Palo was ordered to report to Macon, Georgia at a hospital, but he was soon reassigned here to Andersonville. Palo recalled, quote, I was on duty at the Floyd House in Macon when a requisition was made by the prison department for five regular Confederate surgeons for Andersonville because of a considerable number of cases of hospital gangrene and other surgical cases. I was among the number sent, was transferred, and retained. The confusing chain of command and seemingly overlapping authorities in his is clear in his statement. Listen to this. Quote, I observed in the proceeding of the worst trials that Dr. G.G. Roy Confederate surgeon testified that from the latter part of 1864 until the first part of May 65, he was, by order of General Wilder, in charge of the prison hospital. He may have been in charge of some of the prison books as far as I know, but to, as to the hospital, I have always been under the impression that I was in charge. <laughs> so they didn't even know who was in charge there. Dr. Island in charge of the 1st Division Military Hospital in, inside the stockade. So he goes on to say, even another contradiction. In the worst trial, Dr. Pillow's routine inspections reported to Confederate Surgeon General Preston was weaponized against words. Don't remember the page number, but it was just a routine report, how are things today, and it became a damning tool that was used to beat words over the head, and really, at two things. No medicine, who had it, and a court and bread was bad. Was Wurz out cooking the cornbread? I don't think so. That was a commissary and the cooks. But as per usual, it was taken out of context and discounted. It appears that Pelot served in the medical corps in the chain of command of Surgeon General and not that of the Provost Marshal, and his orders came from Dr. Stout, head of Confederate hospitals, not Major Wurz. Again, all the things that went bad were nailed on Wurz, but he didn't have anything to do with it. On a side note, it's hard to say how many doctors were in various roles at Andersonville. I counted about 30 names. Many were private contractors, some were in the stockade, some were in the second hospital. But remember this, we're in a pandemic right now. Um, what the Confederate military uh, did, they were very concerned. And the Surgeon General made an every effort to inoculate not only the Army and the civilians, but also the inmates of the POW camp. Dr. Pillow was involved in this effort, as was Dr. Jones, and they made sure to take care of the prisoners here. In his memoirs, Pillow picks apart the transcript of the worst trial, especially the interrogation of his friend, Colonel Gibbs, pointing out again that the various commands that controlled the provisioning of the camp over were, which Wurz had zero control. Pillow has emphatically stated, quote, of course the prisoners at Andersonville suffered from circumstances beyond the control of the authorities, conditions as well known to the federal as to the Confederate government, and which could have been remedied by the consent of the federal government to which they absolutely refused the exchange of prisoners. Dr. Pillow particularly appreciated the testimony of George Fetchner, a Union cavalryman who was favorable to wars. Pillow concludes, every effort was made by a prejudiced and vindictive prosecution to break down his evidence. But they didn't. Dr. Pillow also relates his final conversation with Major Wurz, whereupon the news that Federal Major General Wilson summoned Wurz to him. Pillow offered his fine, fast horse and suggested to Wurz that he flee the country back to Europe, for he believed Wilson's invitation was a trap. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we know the rest of the story. Pillow was right. It was a trap. Pillow would survive to be paroled at Madison, Florida in 65 in May. After the war, he settled in Bradenton, Florida, and established a pharmacy that still exists today. 
It is not clear when Pelot wrote his manuscript that I quoted from, but he survived until 1917, and he noted that he withheld writing it to prevent fomenting sectional differences in the war's aftermath. In conclusion, a scapegoat for Andersonville was needed, General Winder was dead, Gibbs had only been there a few months, and so Wurz, the lone, longest tenured officer and a foreigner to boot, was the best they could do. Someone had to pay, facts didn't matter, facts lie, George's invasion by hundreds of thousands of men, resulting in an overwhelming surge of POWs, the hard line curtailment of prisoner exchangers, which exacerbated the overtaxed POW system, the overlapping chains of command and mixed authorities, a pandemic with no germ theory, no medical knowledge of six foot social distancing, all created a perfect storm for a crisis like that at Andersonville. But none of these facts, nor the specter of the precedent that would be set for future miscarriages of justices, mattered to the mob hell bent on vengeance. No, someone had to be blamed for Andersonville. And rather than looking in the mirror, General Wurz would do just fine. Plow perfectly concludes his manuscript with a sentence, quote, Wurz was simply hung because he had been commandant of the prisoners. Thank you. You've been a great audience.